kind of like hacker DIY scene. I'm just down with it because there are people that are taking something that's advertised and sold and sort of programmed in a way into your minds as just being this one thing that you pay money for and that's it. But actually it might have thousands of other more interesting uses. Paul B. Davis is a fine artist and musician who uses computer game hacking to bridge the gap between computers and art. With his pioneering programming ensemble Beige, Davis has exhibited internationally in Rotterdam, New York and London. So this is kind of the first project. This is a record called the 8-Bit Construction Set. So one side's all done on an Atari, and the other side's all done on a Commodore 64. I started on this in 1998, and then my friends at uni, Corey, Joseph, Bon, and Joe Boykman, we worked on it all together. I went to music school. It was a classical music conservatory. I was doing electronic music and composition because my degree was kind of interdisciplinary. My senior year, I had this idea to like make art out of a Nintendo. That was a time when like a lot of what we call new media art was becoming more prominent. You know, I mean, I'm just a nerd, so when I sat down at a computer, I wanted to also have that same level of control. This is sort of Paul Davis Research Laboratories right here. So we have some electronics gear and just like general junk that I'm kind of making stuff with. These are Nintendo cartridges. The chips that originally came with the game have been removed and replaced with uh, these EEPROM chips. I erase them, put my own software on them, and then it just does what you want to do. As if you'd programmed a computer. You essentially did program a computer. You just have to take a few extra steps. This is my art show. It's going to be up for six months, and I've done installation of kind of older hack Nintendo work of mine. This image is ripped from the title screen of Zelda 2. It's such a low resolution that the pixels really show up. I mean, it's almost like, in some ways, these um, systems were almost made for video art, you know what I mean? It's so sharp. I think any artist is changing what they do all the time. That's, I mean, that's what I think good artists do. Basically, anything that's like more than two years old that I made, I hate. And like lately, maybe the last, I don't know, four or five years, I've been doing mostly video stuff by learning the protocol of the video files in the same way that I learned about how a Nintendo works, then that system is sort of like laid out and open for manipulation. What kind of made you decide to start kind of going in this direction? Was it just the kind of rise of things like YouTube and kind of available video? Yeah, basically what happened is um, I was in a show in 2006 with uh, an artist named Takashi Murata. Like, Takashi's stuff is very surface, painterly looking. And he was doing a similar technique. He was basically using these, like, compression artifacts. I kind of started making work using this technique, but process-wise, placed it in the middle of all surface and being all algorithm, I guess. Which is another nice thing about art, actually, because you're influenced by all these different things and you can make work in response to those things that you see. And it's this constant sort of conversation that happens. So I, I did a bunch of these. I, there was one, hold on, I'll show you another one, that I did with um, Jacob Chiachi. That Rihanna song, Umbrella, had just come out. Yeah. And the chorus is the exact same as uh, that Cranberry song. Um, Zombie. Yeah. He pointed this out and then we kind of said, okay, well, let's make a mashup. We use this like hex editor video technique to basically make bits of Rihanna fold into bits of the Cranberries fold back into bits of Rihanna. And one funny thing is that this video was up on Paper Red's YouTube page and I think he titled it like Data Mosh. Just didn't mean anything. And then the name of the technique all of a sudden became data moshing. So <laughs> we didn't really mean for that to happen. I hate that name, but whatever. That's what it is. And then this technique, a couple years after my show, there's an indie band called Chairlift. Their director saw this video, me and Jacob's video, at the MoMA in New York. The director was quite cool. He emailed me and he said, oh, I saw your stuff and it really influenced me. And, you know, check this out. And then as soon as that happened, um, I think, Kanye's producers hurry up and they hurried up and finished his video so his came out a couple days later. And then all of a sudden like the stuff is out there in pop videos and it changes the way your work would be interpreted. So the title of my show was then called Kanye West 
fucked up my show. You know, it's like a little one-liner flip thing, but also I just dropped all that work basically because I didn't want it to mean anything related to pop culture. And then there was this whole uh, discussion online about, you know, the nature of an effect and if it was ours in terms of, you know, the fine art people that were doing it and now it's, has it been reduced or changed into something else because now it's like a, a pop culture reference, I guess. And it's like these two extremes and I just think it's, it's in the middle somewhere and it's, it's just a thing, you know what I mean? And there's gonna be another thing in two years, and there's gonna be another thing like five years after that. It's kind of just the natural flow of tools and information.